Next, we turn to Taiwan, where people voted for a historic third term for the Democratic Progressive Party. President-elect Lai ching tae won more than 40 percent. So what does it mean for relations with mainland China and diplomacy with other nations like the United States? Matt Pottinger is a former U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor, and he's joining Walter Isaacson to discuss this now. Thank you, Christian and Matt Pottinger. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Walter. So we had these elections in Taiwan, somewhat of a unnerving surprise if you're worried about our relationships with China, uh, very much of a, uh, a government that will try to keep its democratic independence from China. Tell us how to assess it and what happened there. Yeah, well, you, what you had was um, the democratic expression of a society that's one of the most successful democracies in the world. Uh, people showed up in uh, in huge numbers, uh, percentages of turnout that, that should uh, really be the envy of the democratic world. And, and what people decided to do was something unusual. This is the first time that the, uh, a, a party has been returned for, in essence, a third term uh, uh, of, of uh, office. Um, after it had really been in sort of eight year cycles that that uh, the opposition would switch with the ruling party. But um, I, I think what you're seeing is, uh, in part, the opposition vote was split between a couple of candidates, uh, which helped boost uh, Vice President Lai to the to the presidency. But he still obtained uh, 40 plus percent of the vote. The president elect has said that this was an expression of democracy over authoritarianism, the great struggle in this world today. Do you think he's going to be able to get along with China, or is that going to provoke China uh, to try to assert more control over Taiwan? Yeah, look, I, th the truth is, if Beijing had played things differently, and they still have the opportunity to play things differently, um, they probably could have had a somewhat productive uh, relationship with the current outgoing president, um, President Tsai Ing-wen. Uh, when President Tsai was elected eight years ago, uh, she made she went out of her way to, in some sense, buck her party platform in order to extend an olive branch to Beijing. Uh, she she uh, made clear, you know, she did several of the things that that Beijing would have wanted to hear. Uh, but Beijing decided rather than than to build on that and start a dialogue with uh, uh, with her government, they froze her out. And for eight years, they have not actually engaged in any kind of productive dialogue, barely any dialogue at all, uh, other than perhaps a little bit of back channel uh, uh, diplomacy. And, and so uh, here we are again. The, you know, Beijing's uh, preferred candidates did not win. Uh, for a third time in a row, Beijing could actually uh, open a dialogue. Uh, and I, my, my guess would be that uh, Vice President Lai, now President-elect Lai, uh, would, would uh, be willing uh, to, uh, to entertain the idea of, of some kind of dialogue. I just don't think Beijing is going to offer it. Uh, Beijing is more interested in control than in dialogue. Uh, and, uh, and, and so... Uh, unfortunately, I think that Beijing is going to miss uh, yet another opportunity here. And to what extent do you think that this could lead to a military confrontation over Taiwan? And what would the timetable be? Does this speed up that timetable? So Xi Jinping has made clear that he's impatient. Uh, uh, he, he doesn't talk the way that his predecessors did about there being time, so long as Taiwan doesn't declare formal independence. That, that time is on Beijing's side. That's not how Xi Jinping sees it. Uh, but the, the other thing is that Xi Jinping has really changed the game. It, 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 a, a lot of his, his predecessor's rhetoric about Taiwan was designed to restrain Taiwan, to, to ensure that Taiwan did not declare independence. Xi Jinping is not trying to maintain the status quo the way that the rhetoric might have suggested by some of his predecessors. Instead, what he's trying to do is is compel Taiwan to move uh, toward uh, unification under the People's Republic of China. And, uh, and that is not something that the vast majority of people in Taiwan want to see. If China right now decided to blockade uh, Taiwan or decided to 
move on it in a military way. Does, what would the, what do you think the U.S. should do, and does the U.S. have the capacity right now to fight a war? Yeah, well, look, the, the, the lesson from Ukraine is that deterrence would have been a whole lot cheaper than war. So let's succeed at deterrence. We can do that. We know how to deter. Uh, we did it during the Cold War. It's why the Cold War stayed cold. But we were spending twice as much, Walter, uh, in the 1980s under Reagan as a percentage of GDP on defense that, as we're spending right now. This is a mistake. This is a mistake. It, 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 we, we need to be uh, showing that we have decisive capabilities, conventional capabilities, that in fact, we already have the technology and the platforms to deliver. It's just that we haven't been building enough of these anti-ship missiles. We haven't been making sure that our attack submarines um, are, are cycling out of port uh, and maintenance uh, quickly enough uh, to, to be a, a, a real problem for Beijing. Let, let's focus on that. Look, if, if Beijing ends up pulling the trigger, uh, it makes that fateful decision that Vladimir Putin has made. Um, I, I actually believe that President Biden has been pretty clear. I don't think I don't think he was speaking off the cuff. You, can't, you might be able to say that he was speaking off the cuff once or twice. But President Biden has now said four times, uh, quite deliberately, that he would uh, back uh, Taiwan militarily uh, in order to prevent a uh, what he called an unprecedented uh, uh, military attack on Taiwan. I think we should take the president at his word. Well, the president said that, and that goes against what was official, I think, U.S. policy which is sort of a strategic ambiguity where we don't quite say outright that we would get involved militarily if there were an attack by China on Taiwan. Should we change U.S. policy and make it unambiguous that we give defense protection to Taiwan? You know, I would argue that President Biden already has uh, made that shift. Um, you know, it, it, it is not the staff of the president, but the president under Article Two of our Constitution who makes our foreign policy. Uh, I, I think we should take President Biden uh, literally, <laughs> take him at his word, and and that in in essence he has already um, uh, removed at least a lot of that fog of ambiguity from the policy. I think it would be unwise for any other presidential candidate to back away from uh, from. The, the position that President Biden has staked on this. Uh, and, and I think that that will actually uh, help keep the peace. Um, you know, wars, wars begin with optimism. Uh, it, it's, one of the, it's one of the things that we often overlook or, or, or forget because uh, it sounds counterintuitive, but if you look at the beginnings of wars throughout history, whether they were launched by, you know, a, a democracy like the United States or, in, or, or, or by dictatorships, uh, it, it often starts with this idea, this kernel of optimism that, my goodness, I think I think that through war, we can achieve things that we couldn't achieve through diplomacy, A, and B, I, I think the war will go really well for us. <laughs> this, is a, this, is a, this is a miscalculation that all sorts of governments make, including our own, uh, has, has believed that wars will be short and decisive uh, when, in fact, they turn out to be murky, incredibly costly, and long. The troops don't come home by Christmas the way the way that uh, that, that leaders often uh, uh, promised. So you are an advisor to President Trump. You're in the National Security Council. What is his view, do you think, and what should it be? What would it be on this notion of being unequivocal that if, if China goes after Taiwan militarily, we will defend Taiwan militarily? Yeah, well, look, I mean, I can speak for for what the policy was during President Trump's uh, uh, last term in office. He, I think that over the course of his uh, time in office, he he came to appreciate um, how problematic a uh, a crisis in the Taiwan Strait would be for the U.S. for our for our economic prosperity, for our alliances with Japan and South Korea and the Philippines and and Australia and others. So he was uh, careful uh, to, uh, uh, you know, not 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 say exactly what he would do. I, I remember him actually saying, "Look, uh, I, I'm not going to say what I'm what exactly what I'm going to do, but but Xi Jinping needs to understand that uh, uh, that that this would be a, a pretty serious matter." Uh, so so in in essence, I think President Trump was sustaining that tried and true uh, policy of 
uh, as you called it, strategic ambiguity. I think that President Biden has now moved the needle uh, to something that is uh, more than ambiguous. <laughs> uh, less it, ambi it, ambiguous. It is less ambiguous in essence. So, uh, so I, I don't know what what uh, President Trump's um, policy would be in a second term, uh, but uh, but I, I think it would be a miscalculation on Xi Jinping's part to test um, uh, any U.S. president. Let me ask you something personally. Uh, I mean, you work with Trump both on that and on COVID, as it came out of, uh, out of uh, uh, you know, across from China to the U.S. Uh, and I've read a lot of the things you've said, and you too have a bit of ambiguity now in your feelings about the Trump administration. So many people you worked with, and like Defense Secretary Esper and others, has said he would be dangerous now. Tell me what your your thoughts are about looking at the possibility of a second Trump term. I don't want to predict how this is all going to turn out. What I will say is that um, uh, any president who uh, indulges isolationism, uh, any president who doesn't have the back of American allies, whether they are in the Western Pacific, like South Korea and, and Japan and the Philippines, or whether they're in Europe, our, our, our incredible uh, alliance structure with NATO, it's the most successful uh, you know, um, multilateral alliance probably in history. Uh, any president who does not have the back of those alliances and institutions uh, will be um, uh, welcome, in essence, by America's adversaries, because America's adversaries view those alliances as the primary obstacle to them achieving their aggression, you know, their aggressive, expansionist, revanchist ambitions. So uh, President Trump in his first term, I think, uh, did uh, maintain the strength of those alliances. He, he, he put a, a lot of fear into, into our allies, particularly in Europe. Uh, where uh, they were afraid that the United States would back away. But in the end, those, those allies stepped up, spent more money, and President Trump reaffirmed those alliances. I, I very much hope that that would be his policy in a second term if, in fact, um, he, he's elected come November. Well, wait, wait a minute. I mean, he has not been supportive of either Ukraine or NATO in this current uh, uh, situation, this current invasion by Russia into Ukraine. And I think I'm hearing you say that that really worries you, but you're parsing it a bit uh, too carefully there. Well, look, I, I don't think I don't think we should turn our back on Ukraine because it, the, the cost of Ukraine falling is going to be radically higher than the cost of us supporting brave Ukrainians uh, to, to uh, fight a war for their national survival. Uh, that, if Ukraine falls, um, th the cost to NATO uh, of even just continuing to deter Russia from going further is going to be dramatically greater than uh, the, the relatively small, I'm sorry, but it, it is in, in real terms, a pretty small investment. We're not putting American lives at risk. We're not shedding American blood. We're helping brave Ukrainians uh, defend their country so that we don't end up with uh, Russia threatening our NATO allies and, and, and pushing us to the brink of a third world war. Um, I, I think it would be unwise to turn our backs. Europe has to do a lot better. President Trump, I, I give credit, particularly in his first term, to basically pointing out how uh, European support for their own alliance structure has fallen short. Uh, I, I think that there's... a, a an opportunity uh, to get to get the uh, Europeans to do more for their own defense, uh, but at the end of the day, he did he did still stick with that alliance structure. Well, wait, don't you worry about the rising isolationism? There's a rising isolationism on the populist yeah. right of the Republican Party. Uh, yeah, it, from it's funny. I, there's I, I agree with you. Uh, it's and it reminds me of the 1930s. The isolationism is not limited to that. Uh, 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 a, a sizable chunk of the Republican Party. It's, there's a different brand of it that is uh, sort of sneaked up on us in the in the Democratic Party as well. It, it, it has different motivations and it has different expressions. But nonetheless, we're in a very 1930s moment right now, Walter, where, um, you know, as I've been reading a lot of 1930s history, 
uh, over the, over the course of the last several months, I've been struck by the similarities, and and I'm hopeful that we learn the lessons, remember the lessons that we learned in blood that had to be written in blood in the 20th century, so that we don't fall into the trap of of isolationism, believing that uh, that the two oceans are going to keep us safe uh, from the sorts of uh, dynamics that we're seeing play out in Europe or in the Middle East, or uh, if we really play our cards badly in the Western Pacific as well. The Chinese foreign minister has been talking about trying to help negotiate the Palestinian, uh, the Hamas, Israel situation. We've spent a lot of time over the past 60 years trying to establish the U.S. as the primary player in the Middle East. Do you think it's a good idea for us to want or to allow China to be involved in the Middle East and to try to sort this out? Is that in our interests? Well, look, I, I, I think that we have to start. The question almost answers itself when you consider the fact that Beijing has been one of the um, uh, one of the agitators that has inflamed the problems that we're dealing with in the Middle East right now. Uh, Beijing is the chief propaganda and diplomatic supporter for Russia. Uh, Russia has provided uh, a, a lot of diplomatic and possibly material support for Hamas. Remember, right after the massacre of, of innocent Israelis on the 7th of October, Vladimir Putin's government hosted a trilateral meeting in Moscow between the leaders of Hamas and, and leaders of Iran. Uh, uh, Beijing has provided propaganda support uh, for Hamas through uh, platforms like uh, the Chinese Communist Party controlled TikTok uh, uh, platform. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, Beijing uh, standing up for, uh, uh, you know, basically undermining Israel and, and its uh, need for security. Even, even Israel's borders have been erased from uh, Chinese websites like Alibaba.com and Baidu.com. So, so Beijing is an agitator here. It is not. It is not interested in maintaining stability. If we, if we, if you read the speeches of Xi Jinping, he talks quite a lot about chaos. He said in, in a speech in 2021, "Chaos is the defining word for our era." And then he went on in that speech to make clear that he thought that was something advantageous to China and its ambitions. That chaos was something bad for Western democracies, uh, and, and as he said. You know, the West is is uh, fading and the East is rising, China's authoritarian agenda. So I, I don't think that China's really interested in, in being a constructive partner with us in the Middle East or pretty much any other part of the world. Matt Pottinger, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Walter. Thanks for having me.